it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Strawberry Hill Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Simmons, and I thank you guys for tuning in. Um, before we get started, please make sure you like, subscribe, click the share link, and hit that notification bell so you can get all the updates of the Strawberry Hill Podcast. Today we have a special guest on, as always, but we've been kind of keeping it, our Wyandotte County All-Stars here that kind of yeah. grew up from the dot and made it out and are doing good things. Today we got the one and only Nate Bucati, man. Nate How are Bucati. you, man? What's up, man? This is great. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, welcome yeah, I'm in. excited to be a part of it. Yeah, and then I got, if you guys have been in and have kind of frequent the lounge, you guys all know Uncle Dave. Uncle Dave is here. Uncle Dave, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here to keep <laughs> things on track. Yeah, and Dave is back, and he is he's ready to rock and roll. So, yeah, I appreciate you, you both coming on, actually, and I'm oh, glad that you. Dave set this up. Um I forgot our little present. Oh. Let me. Well, way to go! It's right up there, that black well, bag. Oh, he's getting all that. I really want to say thank you for for this because when I ran into you and uh, the MLS All Star match yeah. in DC, I'm gonna be honest with you. I geeked out because I I knew of you at, a couple times, and then I met. I know your father, but yeah, uh, Tony Miola was there, so I was really excited. Yeah. So thank you for coming out, my friend. That was uh, that was that was awesome getting run into you there. I just got to start working with Tony on a consistent basis this year. I'd known him for years, but this was the first year we worked together. And uh, getting to see you at that All-Star game gave me some street cred with Tony because yeah. you told him what my old man did and all <laughs> yeah. that stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah look, good. let's I'm go. I'm so thankful. That, that was, was cool. a cool moment. More yeah. Coming. yeah, so we had, uh, we had my cousin Earl Watson on last week. Good man. And now we got you on. And then I know that you are – Original Dot also, and Strawberry Hill is like kind of, you know, you know a lot about the Strawberry Hill and yeah. background of stuff. So we have these shirts made for kind of like a lot of our members here. It's called Strawberry Hill Mafia. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, with the yeah. Godfather with the puppets. Yeah. Love so it. We got a couple oh, for man. you, man. I didn't know what size oh, you yeah. were, large or extra large, so I got two. The so. severity of the, of the importance of you getting that shirt is family. So... That's a big step. Yeah, no you're, you're part so of the family. Time you just give away. This one's yours. You can sleep in that one. Who knows? You might I mean, have a hey, This means yeah. a lot, honestly. Yeah. It does. Uh, yeah, I see you already repping the Waco Rays. Oh, so yeah. you, you, I, I got yeah. a couple of those shirts. Yeah. So now you can. <laughs> you, you know, I, I will fully confess I live in Johnson County right now. It's all right. It's all I'm right. not trying to say anything bad about Johnson County, <laughs> but my wife can tell you that I'm. I'm quick to make sure everybody where I live knows that I'm from KCK. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. You can take the kid out of the dot, but you can't take the dot out of the kid, know. you know? I always tell people, it's like, I think we are one of the only counties in the country that we have our own shirts. Yeah. And we are proud. And if you are yeah. not from Wyandotte County <laughs> and you're wearing a Wyandotte County <laughs> shirt, it's like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Are you from Wyandotte County? <laughs> it's like, we accept transplants, but yeah. you got to go through like a vet process. Oh, it's a big process, <laughs> but we get around. <laughs> no, honestly, it means a lot to be considered a KCK guy because I did bounce around a lot. You know, mm-hmm. growing up, I, I lived in a lot of different areas of Wyandotte County, but I did from first grade through fourth grade. I lived in Johnson County. Mm-hmm. My parents got divorced. I, I moved to a small town in southern Kansas called Ark City with Ark my mom City, yeah. for two years. But then that wasn't a cultural fit for me. I, <laughs> I struggled down there socially and everything. So by that point, my dad had moved back to KCK, and, and I moved back here with him. And I went, lived in KCK from seventh grade all the way through high school. Mm-hmm. But if you ask me where I'm from, I feel like I get to claim all those places, but I would tell you I'm from I'm from KCK, yeah. mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, even though I don't live there live here now, that's this is this is always to me where I'm from, and I'm more proud to say that I'm from. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and I some of my buddies will flip me grief because I you know oh you know you're not real KCK anymore. That hurts. You know, like yeah. that that hurts. <laughs> nah, it's in there. It's in. So there. I you know I I, pre- I appreciate being being uh, accepted. Of course, you know? I think another thing is like it's like once you're from Wyandotte County, you rep it. Forever, oh, yeah. it's like no matter. I mean, even yeah. you got all the celebrities that are out, or even just Rick, just people that are on the street. If they're in Texas or another country or state, yeah. doesn't matter. It's like if they're like, yeah, I'm from Wyandotte County. I'm from you know, KCK. It, it's kind of like Kansas City in general in terms of like I've been traveling a lot this year for my job, and mm-hmm. I always notice on the flight home, 
I look around, how many people are repping KC in some way on their flight? Mm -hmm. You don't see that when you're, like, if I'm flying to Houston, you don't see just a whole bunch of people decked out in gear that says Houston on it. Yeah. But when, you, when you're flying on a KC flight, people are repping Kansas City. Absolutely. And then, like, when you're in Kansas City, people rep where they're from. Mm -hmm. I think especially KCK, though. Like, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a civic pride to, oh, yeah. you know, being from here. We can talk about. I, I think there's some really good reasons for that. Yeah. You know. Well, I have to jump in. I'm a Bonner Springs Braves. Right. I'm a Brave. Right. So I'm. Oh, I'm yes. It's not K technically <laughs> KCK. So we got but, Piper Ward and Bonner here. So yeah. Just throwing that out to real early. Right. It's. <laughs> it's still the dot though, right? Yes, yeah. it is. I mean, yes, it is, and I'm proud of it too. Yeah. I love yeah, it. Yeah, and going back to your comment, like on the people in the plane, it's like we are a t like. We all dress like tourists here, <laughs> but we're not tourists. Like yeah. we just love yeah. Kansas City. Yeah, and yeah, like yeah. I mean, I I have I can't tell you how many KC shirts I have. Granted, I mean, I do have like a, a lot of Chief shirts, but I, whew, that hurt last night. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a tough one. That was a tough one. Um, yeah, but anyway, I don't want to get too much into that. I, that's. I might get into it later, but yeah. Whew. The yeah. point about dressing as a tourist, though, it's funny because I, I didn't really even really realize how much KC stuff I had when I started doing this job for Major League Soccer this year, where I'm supposed to be neutral and 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 cover each team exactly the same. I'm a little sensitive to what I wear mm -hmm. a yes. lot of times, you know. Yes. And all of a sudden, I started realizing. Everything I wear has a, like I'd get on a Zoom call with a coach and I'm wearing something that says KC yeah. on it. Even yeah. if it doesn't say Sporting Kansas City, it says KC on it somewhere. And I was like, man, I got to go find some clothes that just don't have anything so, on so it. So I'm glad you brought that up. So, one, so you are one of the hosts of Border Patrol 810 Sports Radio. And then you work for MLS. Mm -hmm. And then awesome, you do a little M MMA stuff. Did some right? MMA, yep. yep. And you've got quite the background. And then that's what I was going to ask you is, and then you work for MLB. So you, I mean, you have gone like all over the, the sports network, but how do you, how do you control that fandom where, cause like I knew like if I was calling a game yeah. for the chiefs or someone, I would be very pro chiefs and it'd be hard for me to, <laughs> so I know yeah. that you do sporting and you've done the Royals and you've done some chief stuff. Like how do you control that fandom when you're, you see or you're working with your own team? Well, you know, it depends on the job, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're doing, um, when I was doing the Sporting Kansas City games, there's almost an expectation yeah. that, that you're a bit of a homer. They they would mm -hmm. call it, you know, you're you're calling the game for the Sporting KC fans, so they want you to get excited when Sporting mm -hmm. does something well. Um, but I think that part of the job, it's 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 the job. You know, you you need to do a, you need to be professional, and. Um, I remember actually having a conversation with Graham Zusi from Sporting Kansas City my first year doing the sporting games. And he, we, I ran into him at breakfast on a road trip, and he said, so let me ask you a question. When the other team scores a goal, do you get excited or do you sound like, you know, your dog just got shot or something, you know, like you sound depressed? And I said, well, I, I feel like you got to give it a big call, you know, because mm -hmm. you never know who's watching. And he, I wasn't sure what he was going to say, and he said, thank you. He goes, I can't stand it when I listen to broadcasters and one team scores and they sound depressed about it because mm -hmm. scoring a goal is really, really hard. Scoring really hard a goal at the professional level is a, a huge accomplishment. That deserves a big call. That, does, that player, that team, they deserve their moment. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be you know, disrespected like that. And so you need to give it a big call. And I never really thought about it in those terms, but I've always remembered that ever since he said that, you know, and it's really been a challenge this year, the times that I got to do some sporting games. I did the first game that they played against St. Louis and they got their butts kicked. Mm -hmm. and I remember the first goal St. Louis scored, they, they, it was a penalty. And in the back of my head, I was thinking, man, that shouldn't have been a penalty. And all oh, mm -hmm. this is because I've got a relationship with a lot of those players. This is going to suck for them. And, I was thinking, though, luckily it was a penalty, so I had time to kind of think it, and I was like, this is going to be the first goal in the history of this rivalry. This is a massive moment for St. Louis, all of their fans, yeah. their organization. They deserve to have this moment called like it, like any, like any, a St. Louis fan would call mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And that was something I had to like, no, that, that's, what, that's, what I'm, that's my job right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so you got to do your job, you know, and the more I did it through the course of the year, the more you start to just become a fan of the whole league anyway. Yeah. 
And so get excited whenever there's a good moment because that's a moment for the league, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm super glad to hear you say that story because of Zussi. And that's the, the words that he said to you. Because I, as a coach, to, as a, I always watch the game as a coach. Right. And I watch them as athletes. And I've always respected his style and his vibe and what he brought to the table. And then mm-hmm. you adding that little story made it even better because I know this was his last. He, he, yeah. He's done playing. But, uh, is he, like, retired, retired? Or is he going? I don't know that he's made an official announcement yet. He's done with sporting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But thank you I, for that. I would think he is. But, but, yeah, no, I wouldn't be surprised if he becomes a coach someday. I agree. He's a Agreed. really thoughtful guy. Yeah. You know, very thoughtful guy. So – how did you – I know you went to Ward and, you know, Waiko Roots. Ward's a big baseball school. Yep. Where did the love from soccer come from? You know, it's funny. Because um, I know they make – I know they kind of tease you on, on – yeah. I'm a big fan, by the way. Listen. But oh, that's every, what those guys call it. Every day. day. Yeah. I know they get the alarm every time. You yeah, start soccer about, alarm. Yeah. So it's funny. I mean, like, when I was living in Overland Park as a little kid, I played, I played soccer. Then when my mom moved me down to Arc City, Kansas, there's not a lot of soccer. They were a wrestling, mm-hmm. you know, school. Not a lot of soccer down there. And then I moved back to KCK. No soccer in seventh or eighth grade. I actually didn't start playing soccer until my junior year of high school. Um, and that was just to get in shape for basketball season, honestly, because I was so little, I wasn't really having any success in football at all. And I knew some guys that were on a soccer team. They're like, hey, man, you're a little guy. You can run. Come play soccer with us. It's fun. And I had a lot of fun, but honestly, at that time, you know, our, our athletic director was the football coach mm-hmm. and he thought soccer was all the wimps that couldn't play football. <laughs> yep. We weren't allowed to, we had to play, we played over our home games were either at, oh uh, God, what was the name? Uh, the name of the park over on Metropolitan over Leo Alvey. Maybe it was over, Leo o- Alvey over across, you know, you go across 635 on the Metropolitan yeah. Avenue, there was a park over There's there. There's Fisher that, Park. I think Alvey was right. I yeah. think it was Alvey Park. And so we played some games at City Park. Yeah. Yeah, but we played in public parks because we couldn't play. Mm-hmm. And we, we, yeah. we had our practices right over here. Uh, was it the St. Margaret's? Is that the name of the? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we played. We, we, pra- we had to run that hill what all What year time. was that, if you don't mind? It was 1993 yeah, yeah. and four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, when I played. Um, I graduated in 94, so I guess if it was a fall sport, it would have been 90. Two and ninety three, the two falls that I played soccer at Ward, and I really enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. But even then, you know, our coach was a guy they like. They brought in. He was reading out of a textbook, trying to learn how to <laughs> teach us soccer, and yeah. And um, I didn't really fully understand how much I loved soccer, honestly, until two thousand six. Mm-hmm. I was traveling with the Kansas City Royals. Being a Ward guy, I always thought baseball. I was a big baseball guy and everything. And I thought like traveling with the Royals was going to be my dream job. And the truth was I was not happy um, doing that job. And um, 2006, I was traveling with the Royals, which honestly though was an incredible experience because I didn't get to travel a ton growing up. Mm -hmm. I went to maybe Chicago a couple times as a kid. Um, Not a lot. I didn't go to many places. And, um, for that job, all of a sudden, I got to go to like every major city in the mm-hmm. world when I was in my early 20s on somebody else's dime. Yeah. And when you yeah. travel the baseball team, you get to spend three or four days in those cities. So I got to really feel like I saw America and saw a lot of cool ballparks yeah, and all awesome. that. But the grind of baseball and the just the, the pace of the sport, the, the everyday nature of it. Mm-hmm. It's a long season. It's a man. long season. And, and like the old adage I learned um, was... Uh, Best thing about baseball is there's a game every night. The worst yeah. thing about baseball is there's a game, game every night. Every night. And uh, it was, I just was realizing, and I was, it was, I was having a tough time with it, and the World Cup was in Germany in 2006, and I just got super hooked on it, man. I mm-hmm. watched like every game, because they were in the mornings, and I didn't have to be at the ballpark till late afternoon. And I watched every game, and that was when I really realized, man, this is the best sport in the world. There's a reason it's the most popular sport in the world, and I love it. And th- that's kind of what started it right mm-hmm. there. So how did you get into broadcasting and the sports radio world? Like, I know you went to KU. Yeah, right? well, I wanted, to be a, I wanted to be a play-by-play guy since I was 11 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, back when I was living in Arc City down, down in southern Kansas – Every other weekend, we would spend going back and forth between Kansas City and Arc City. I'd come up and visit my dad, 
And I mean, this is, you know, this was the late eighties and early nineties. So we, we didn't have cell phones or iPods or anything like that. Yeah. So literally you sit in the car for three and a half hours with your parents those and times. You, had to, had, you had to actually converse with your parents, you know? <laughs> like, can you imagine? My kids would just think that's the worst thing mm-hmm. ever. Uh, but honestly, it's like it makes me think I need to tell my kids that they got to put their phones down when they're in a the car with me because one of the best conversations that ever happened. We were driving home to Kansas City on a Sunday night, me and my dad in, in the car. And, you know, you're in the middle of the Flint Hills. The only thing that would come in was talk radio, mm-hmm. uh, AM radio. Yep. So we would always listen to the ball games. My dad, that's the only th- father-son thing that my dad and I did was play sports and watch sports together. My dad didn't know how to fix cars. He didn't know how to build things or, you know, like that's like me. That's all we did was play ball and watch ball. And so we were listening to a game and I remember like, I can remember the conversation. My dad was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I don't know, maybe a shortstop or a point guard. And he said, well, I hope you have a backup plan. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds like your dad. Yeah, yeah. He's, you know, KCK guy, man. He just tells you you like it is. He doesn't really care if you're going to like what what he has to say or not. And I remember I was like, well, what is that supposed to mean? He said, well, are you the best player on your team right now? And I said, no, but I mean, I'm a starter, you know. And he said, well, the best player on your high school team might get to go to college. And the yeah. best player on your high school team might get to go. If you, if you start varsity in high school, you ought to be proud of yourself, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, he really kind of laid it out for me, the, how exceptional you have to be if you want to be a pro athlete. And uh, so I sat there pouting for a little bit while we are listening to the game. And then I was like, ah, he actually he's making a pretty good point. I, I probably that, – that probably is a lot – more hard, difficult than I realized. So as we were listening to the game, I thought, well, what about the guys describing the game? You know, I always mm-hmm. liked those guys. And he said, well, I always thought that'd be a really cool job. I think, uh, I think you could, you could do that probably. And we started talking about what, what it would take. And from that moment on, that's all I ever wanted to do. I, I never thought about doing anything else with my life. I, I remember when I got to college for a little bit and I started realizing how, difficult it was going to be just to even get my first job, yeah. let alone actually ever make it anywhere in this business. I contemplated maybe going to law school, trying to follow in my old man's footsteps or maybe studying history or something like that. And actually a guy that I grew up with, Matt Zising, who was a Holy Family kid, I took, I, we went out for, uh, for some beers. I was a junior in college. I remember told, telling him that, and he just cussed me out. He was like, you've been telling everybody – that would listen since you were 11 years old, that this is what you want to do with your life. Yeah. And you're going to, you're going to sell yourself short before you even give it, give it a shot. You can always go back to grad school someday mm-hmm. if it doesn't work out, but you got to, you got to see this thing out. You know, you should never sell yourself short. And I'm really glad for that conversation, you know, because that's the only time I ever thought about doing anything else. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that was, that was the start of it right there. Well, Michael and I know your father. Well, you know, we, yeah. we both were in the union and he yeah. was our, and I can see him doing that to you. And, I, and I've always <laughs> have respected his straight to the point, right? And I learned a lot about how the mouth can be your best and worst quality. And, it, and he did, a, and I'm glad he did that to you because you definitely yeah. do good. Well, you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to, I'm, there's certain parts of my, my dad's approach to life that I agree with and other parts I don't. That's probably sure. how everybody is mm-hmm. with their parents. But I always appreciated my old man's honesty. Yeah. You know, like he, he, um, and sometimes I will tell him even to this day, you know, that didn't need to be said, dad. Like nobody was asking, (laughs) you know, he'll offend people, you know, but the good thing about him is like, you never have to worry about where you stand. I mean, he's not going to, he'll definitely let you know. He's not going to just, just kiss your ass and tell you something that he doesn't believe. He's going to tell you what he thinks. And, you know, he always gave me the credit as a kid to have honest conversations with me. He Mm. never like, you know, I think sometimes you have a tendency with your kids to think they're not ready for some news, you know, that, well, this, we shouldn't talk about this in front of them or whatever. Cause they're not ready to handle it. My dad would talk about anything in front of me and he would be honest yeah. about it and give me the credit that I could handle the information. And, um, I'm really glad he did that because the truth is life happens to everybody. It happens to kids too. Yes. Kids get sick. Mm-hmm. Kids die. You know, and you can hide all that stuff. You can try, but the world doesn't hide it from yeah. them. And so you might as well have, be willing to have conversations. That was always his approach. Yeah. And I always appreciated that. Well, I, I met him in 05. And okay. I started to 
pick up on his vibe and his style. Yeah. And I was a new dad and a new yeah. dad, a new SAR supervisor and all that. And I used a lot of his techniques really? in the way I delivered my talk because I've got a reputation uh, throughout the troops and my, my little circles of being someone straight to the point. Yeah. yeah. I am... My mouth gets me in and out of a lot of trouble, and I really mean that. <laughs> yeah, me and, too. <laughs> but I mean it with heart. You know, I yeah. give it genuine, yeah. factual stuff, and I think that's what gets me out of trouble when I get into it, if I do. But I anyway. think there's a, I think there's a Wyandotte County thing about that, though. You I know, agree. I think a lot of the people totally. that I grew up around, they're just they're going to tell you what they think. A lot of people don't know that <laughs> the slogan for our city is legit. It's not for amateurs. That's our slogan <laughs> for why not counting. You look it up. Not I didn't for realize amateurs, that. Yeah, that I like that. Very true. Yeah, yeah. yeah not you for amateurs. If you're not ready, <laughs> yeah. If you're not ready for it, you know, mm-hmm. tough, tough cookies, man. So <laughs> tell me about your, I guess, your first gig, like getting out of college. Like, what did you do first? Well, my my first paid job in broadcasting was actually while I was in college at KOFO radio in Ottawa, Kansas. Mm -hmm. I would drive down there at like once or twice at night during the weeks. And then on the weekends and I would do what they call a board shift where you push the buttons and make sure everything gets the air. And there you got to do little news reports at the top of the hour and weather updates. And then I started, I got to do the high school baseball games there, the American Legion baseball games, six bucks an hour, whatever it was. (laughs) I interned at KMBZ Radio in, in Kansas City for Don Fortune mm-hmm. um, in the late, that was late 90s. My first full-time job was in Moberly, Missouri, which Moberly, is a Missouri. town about 30 m- miles north of Columbia. So yeah. you go down I-70, you get to Columbia, you go straight north for 30 miles. And they had a big radio station uh, there called Superstation Crest, 100,000 watt FM station that kind of covered the whole northern mm-hmm. half of the state of Missouri. They had an AM station and another little FM station, and their big thing was high school. Well, they, they they did farm shows. I did I did farm shows. I did some. <laughs> I hosted something they called the Moberly Trading Post, which was like craigslist for am radio and small towns back in the day nice. people would call in and sell like an old tractor you know or whatever so you'd be reading ads yeah and i would just listen to somebody call in and i would take their phone number down and then somebody else would call in and say hey what was the phone number for that tractor with no engine in it you oh, know wow. and, and uh that was part of my job they literally had a a, a, sh- a segment that you did every night called the obituary the obit roundup where you just read obituaries for like a half hour straight what because every funeral home in every small town had to pay for advertising uh-huh. if they wanted their obituaries read on the show. But then the big thing was I, I did all that during the week. I DJed country music, which I didn't know anything about. And, I did not uh, picture oh, this. Dude, <laughs> I got yelled at for mispronouncing a lot of country music singers' names. Oh, Travis Trite. Uh, yeah, well, I, remember I, I remember calling uh, the one I got. What was it? Uh, uh, shoot, I'm going to – I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting it now, but uh, – uh, I, I, Yeah, I butchered, I butchered some names. Um but uh, but then on the weekends I got to do the high school game of the week, uh-huh. which was uh, you know I would they would send me out in this uh, red station wagon called the the Crest Red Rover. It looked like <laughs> the, like the Ghostbusters Ecto One type of thing nice. with the fake radio equipment on top, and you would drive into town wherever the big rivalry football game of the weekend was Brookfield versus Marceline. I remember that was the first game I did, but I would do whatever high school football game. Uh-huh. And that, so that was my first job. That was, uh, I, I spent a year out there not knowing if, how long I would be there, you know? Yeah. And I remember I got out of college and all my friends were going to take good jobs in big cities <laughs> or go to grad station. school in cool cities and stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to go make 15 grand a year doing <laughs> farm shows and DJ country music and all this. And so did the, uh, the football games kind of give you the bug? Cause that probably where you brought a lot of excitement to it. You were probably able to, spin that was the payoff. Bit. The whole reason I went there was to get reps doing, doing sports, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, yeah. and in order to get to do that, I mean, I got paid like a hundred bucks a game in addition to my full-time salary yeah. of, um, you know, whatever, 15 grand or whatever mm-hmm. to do all the other stuff. But yeah, that, I mean, dude, all I wanted to do was do sports. I, yeah. I, I was like, I remember my, my dad was really big on, you know, setting goals and he always called them incremental goals. Okay. So like, let's say your, your goal is to call the Super Bowl someday. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. you got to set a whole bunch of incremental goals to get to that, to way. get there. So I remember my first goal was, to get a job getting paid to broadcast. Mm-hmm. And I did that when I got that job at KOFO, six bucks an hour, yeah. but I got paid to be on the air. Yeah. Then it was to get paid to call 
sports. Mm -hmm. And then I got that when I started doing those little high school baseball games and stuff. And my next goal was to get a full-time job as a sports guy. You know, like just no, getting paid to do nothing but sports. And the first job I got doing that was in Kansas City for a little startup sports radio station called 1250 The Game, which was owned by the same company, the 980 KMBZ. They decided yeah. to try to launch an all-sports station. And they that's when I moved back to Kansas City after a year in Moberly. So that was my first full-time sports gig. And so it's kind of like, then I just took every job I could get ever since then and tried to piece it together. What's you know? cool about that is you actually had the plan and you're following it step by step. You're yeah, climbing yeah. that ladder. At least it sounds like it. Yeah. You can it, tell that story. It, it is. I mean, like, that's why I do think incremental goals. My dad yeah. was right about that. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you got to set the biggest pie in the sky goal you possibly can bigger than you think is even really possible. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you got to set measurable ones along the way and focus on getting to the next one. Instead of like, well, how am I ever going to get there? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's um, process. Yeah. but I would say the weird thing about sports casting, though, I remember I went to a sports casters camp my junior year of high school. Is it really? Yeah. I Shout out Roger. Yeah, I didn't either. Shout out Roger Camps, who was my my hi Camps. history and social studies teacher at Bishop Ward High School. Uh -huh. And he was one, like, you know, a lot of I, I told anybody that was willing to listen, I'm going to be a sports caster when I grow up. And you could see by the reaction. Some people were like, oh, that's cute. You know, yeah. Good luck to you. Even teachers, you know, and then other people that like that really encouraged you to chase it. Like, you know, and, and um, Mr. Camps pulled me aside one day and he had a cutout of an article in the newspaper about this sportscasters camp in St. Louis. Bob Costas was my favorite play by play oh, yeah, guy. Yeah, I, I always yeah, admired I him and he was going to be the big keynote speaker at the end of the camp. And um, he said, hey, look at this. You know, Bob Costas is going to be there. You got to go to this. It was like 2000 bucks, and this was like 1993, you know? Like and, Dad? and I was like, man, I don't have $2,000, Mr. Camps. And he said, well, maybe you get your dad to, you know, pay for it. And I said, I'm not even going to ask Steve Bucati yeah. for $2,000 yeah. to go to a camp, you know? And he said, well, maybe you could work out a deal with him where you, you know, you um, get a part-time job, and maybe you pay for half of it. He paid for the other half. Uh, you got it. He's, and he's fine. He said to me, look, You've been telling me since I've known you that this is what you want to do for mm -hmm. a living. If you're serious about it, this is the kind of thing you find a way to get to. And, um, and, I, and I did, and I went to the camp, you know, because uh, it, it's good to have people in your life that encourage you to take those types of yeah. steps, you know. One cool story from that camp, too, is because um, I've had, I can tell you stories about people my first professor in college who told me I was never going to make it in the business because my voice was too high. <laughs> but on the flip side, at that camp. We can give a shout out to him if you want. You know yeah, what? He got me yeah. my first job. He got me that job in Moberly. Props for him. You know, and, and honestly, it was good. It was good because it, it, it taught me, he taught, it made me realize, like, I'm never going to get anywhere on my talent. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to work, yeah. you know, and outwork other people because I'm not as talented as they are. And that was good that he did that. But, um. But it was also good to have people that made you believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when I was at that sportscasters camp, Kevin Harlan came for a day. And he was, and you he's know, from Kansas City, right? He was the voice of the Chiefs. Yeah. I think he maybe, I can't remember. Maybe if he's, he's not from Kansas City, but he's. Well, he's, he lives here now. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I think he would tell you he's from Kansas City now. Mm -hmm. he, you know, and, and he, uh, I can't remember if he was still the voice of the Chiefs at that time or not, but he was legendary already and oh, he was yeah. doing NBA. And, um, one of the things they had us do at the camp is they took us to this AAU basketball tournament for a day. Mm -hmm. And they set every kid at the camp, or per, there were some grownups at this camp too. They set us all up with tape recorders and headsets along the, along the court. And they just gave us the rosters and had us do play by play of these high school AAU basketball yeah. games. And then they That's would cool. critique us. And during one of the games, Kevin Harlan was there that day and he just walked up and down and he sat down next to me and he put on the extra headphones and he listened to me call like three or four minutes of the game. Awesome. And as soon as it went to a commercial break and I remember I was nervous. I was like, oh, yeah, Kevin you're, Harlan's oh, yeah. listening to me right now. Goats. He yeah. takes his headset yeah. off and dude, he talks when he talks to you in real life, he sounds just like he sounds when he's doing mm -hmm. a game and he, he gets off the headset and he hits me on the shoulder. He goes, young man. You have a future in this business. You're really talented. Don't give up on this. Nice. And he walked off. Mm -hmm. And man, you couldn't tell me nothing oh, after that. Man. You know, I was like, I might, I might as well float it out of the gym. Heck yeah. And you know, 
And I've told Kevin that story. I was just about to say that. Yeah. You, really, you guys get to talk to him. Yeah. I've told him that story. And he uh, he's such a humble guy. He mm-hmm. just kind of laughs it off. But I tell him, I'm like, you. I hope you realize the power that your words had to a young kid who really, like, you gave me more motivation, like, belief that I could really pull uh-huh. this off somehow. And that's important in life, you know, to have people like that do that. For good, you, so. good for you for saying that to him, too, because well, that keeps... Keeps yeah. people doing that. The bigger yeah, thing I want to yeah. do, and I wanted him to know that, but the bigger thing is I want to make sure that that I hopefully will give a young person that has the yeah, aspirations yeah. of doing something in their life, I would like for them to remember me someday, like, hey, man, you gave me some encouraging words. Absolutely. It make, makes you be mindful of, like, when a young person tells you what they want to do with their life, mm-hmm. take them seriously. Yeah. You know, it's going to be up to them whether they do it or not, but take them seriously and, and give them encouragement. Yeah. You know? I think about that stuff constantly when I coach because yeah. every single word that comes out of that mouth, they could take it away. Right. And, and that's, yeah, oh, I, I totally support the, yeah. that, like what yeah. you said. So how did you get your foot in the door for where you're at now? Because, I mean, now mm. it's like you're, you're the <laughs> morning host where – I, I know that's probably one of the number one shows at A10. Mm. And you do MLS, you do the MMA, you do the MLB. Like you, you, you now you got your foot in everything. So. Yeah, I, it's funny because I, I would give this advice to anybody in any aspect of life. At least my journey has not been like there was one moment that that was my breakthrough. Yeah, it's like I, I remember my buddy Ruben one time told me that he he appreciated my approach in that I never go up to the plate professionally looking to hit the grand slam home run. I just try to scratch out a base hit every Uh day. Mm -hmm. And then there's guys that are in the hall of fame because they scratched out 3000 of them, you know? And, um, I think that's kind of been, my career has been, I could give you 17 different breakthrough moments that I had, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it really was more like taking every opportunity that I got, um, Getting back to Kansas City was a huge one. Um, getting the Kansas University women's basketball play-by-play job mm. was a huge one for me. Um, and I did that for 14 years. Um, getting to work on the Royals broadcast and travel with the team was a huge one. Getting, getting to, to start co-hosting the morning show with Steven, I didn't even want to do talk radio. Mm-hmm. They came to me and asked me because he needed a co-host – And I was like, man, I always want to do play-by-play. I didn't really want to be a talk radio guy, but I realized it was an opportunity that I I would be stupid to pass up. And now, you know, 17 years later, we've been doing the show together still. Yeah, it really has. It's been crazy. And then, you know, taking the Sporting Kansas City job was a leap because that was a transition from one, from doing a certain other sports to, you know, pivoting to soccer. That was a... That was a big decision. You know, that was one that wasn't made lightly. Um, so all those different moments were just, it's like hard to say which one was the, was the mm. foot in the door. You know what I mean? It was like, take every chance you can get, say yes to everything you possibly can say yes to. Yeah. And, and um, I do remember uh, early in my career when I was doing that, working at 1250 The Game, and that radio station didn't even make it on the year for, air for a year. Oh, it was wow. off the air in one year. Yeah. And I thought, man, I just moved back to Kansas City. I'm, I had plans to move into my sister's basement mm-hmm. if I got let go and didn't have a job. Uh, but I used to go, Ryan Lefevre and I used to go to the Phoenix downtown every Tuesday night. Yep. And he was, a men, he was a guy, I just kind of reached out to him because I was looking for mentors. I was looking mm-hmm. for people like, I want to be like him someday. And he had just moved from, Can- from Minnesota to Kansas City and didn't really have any friends in town. And so we would go every Tuesday night. We would listen to jazz music and just talk about life and career. You you can do that here now because we have live jazz music every Friday and Saturday. Is that right? Yeah. I might have to bring Ryan down here this (laughs) wintertime. That would be cool. Yeah, the vibe's awesome. Sorry to interrupt. Live music. I'd have to plug my stuff in there for a second. (laughs) Sold, by the way. Live jazz music just sets, it just, it, it opens up a vibe that you need to be around, yeah. you know? Well, and we hanging would, out at the Phoenix, mad props to Matt Jones. That's a good place to chill was, for some good jazz. Oh, so man, we love that. that. The, very similar, like, with the brick exterior mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And um, But um, anyways, I remember him telling me one time, because I was, I was frustrated at that time. I, I wanted opportunities, and I didn't feel like anybody was taking me seriously, and he yeah. was always trying to help me get, get jobs that, that uh, were a little more legit than the one that I had. And, and uh, I remember him saying... 
you know, someday you're going to get to a point where the jobs come to you instead of you s- trying for every job out there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I remember like finally getting to a little bit of a point like that where it was people are calling me saying, hey, we need somebody like the MMA thing. That was somebody calling me going, hey, they, hear me out. I know you've never done MMA before, but mm-hmm. I actually think you'd be good at it and we need a guy. Would you be willing to give it a shot? And um, I, I still, though, even at this point, I feel like I'm at a stage in my life where I don't want to say no to anything if yeah. I can possibly say yes, because yeah. you just never know when the opportunities will come. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was not, it, it has been good to be at a place like that where people actually call you mm-hmm. before a job ever gets posted online yeah, or awesome. anything like that. You know, I hope to stay in that position because it's tenuous <laughs> always. Yeah, when I was doing concert security, like event staff, Towards the end of it, I did it in the mid to late 90s to early 2000s, and they started reaching out certain events, certain concerts, right. and it's the same thing, and you feel yeah. like, wow, I've kind of hit that spot where yeah. they do come to you. And yeah. so that speaks volumes, because I've listened to a lot of your, your commentaries, and I enjoy the heck well, out it's of Well, it's a relationship business. You yes. know, I mean, it's, relationships are as important as anything else, and when somebody knows that they feel like they can trust you, you're going to be prepared, you're going to be easy to work with, they're more likely to call you than to pick than, than to hire somebody that they don't know anything about, even mm-hmm. if that person's resume or reel looks really good. Yeah. So maintaining relationships is huge. So you've been in the game for how long, you say? Well, I graduated college in 1998. So my first full-time job was in the summer of 98. So 20, 25 years, I guess. That's awesome. Yeah, it's and kind so of scary to think tell about. Tell me what it's been like. <laughs> the so in that 25 creepy. years, you have seen sporting win. Yep. You've seen the Royals win right. and the Chiefs win twice. And you As a Jayhawk, to, I'll also throw oh, in a sorry. couple yes. of titles and, and there. Two too. titles with KU. <laughs> yes. So and you've also worked directly with the teams, yeah. you know, during yeah. those championship runs. Tell me what that's been like. Because now you're <laughs> super you're fanning out and you get to like yeah. do it for your yeah. job too. Well, I got to go to the 2013 MLS Cup final for yes. sporting as a fan. Mm-hmm. I wasn't calling the games yet, so I was a season ticket holder, and I was in the cauldron for that one. I was there, too, and it yeah, was very cold. It was very cold. <laughs> yeah, it was very cold. And I, uh, it was funny because I took my cousin Leah, who's a KCK kid as well. She grew up in West Height neighborhood, and she wasn't even a soccer fan, but she was kind of going through some stuff at the time. And I remember like sporting had called me and said, hey, by the way, We're going to have a VIP after party um, if we win and you and, and, and a plus one can come if you want Mm -hmm. to. And we didn't have enough. We had a babysitter available for either the game or the after party. Not both. So my wife could go to one or the other. Mm -hmm. And I said, so do you want to come to the game with me uh, and stand in the freezing cold, or would you rather take your chances that if they win, you can come to the after party with me? And she said, after party. Well, <laughs> she didn't want to, nice. she didn't want to stand smart. out in the freezing cold. So I, I called my cousin Lee up cause I knew she kind of, she needed to pick me up at the time. And, um, we went, we drank a few shots to warm mm-hmm. ourselves up. We had a blast. Oh, yeah. at that Those game. games are so much fun. Absolutely. We had so much fun. And so, um, that was a great memory. When the Royals won the World Series, you know, I was doing work for MLB Network at the time. So that was pretty cool to get to be a part of that. Um, I was honestly, I got to do more work for MLB Network in the 2014 season, Mm -hmm. which was really cool because I was like down in the, you know, down on the MLB Network set every night. And that was, to me, in a weird way, almost more fun because it was also the first time the Royals had made a run like that in 30 years, you know? Um, So that was really, really incredible. Because it was Plus, such a magical run because they didn't lose a game yeah, until the whole series. Yeah. yeah. So, I, was, yeah. Yeah. I was a fan. I was in the stands a few times during that run, and it was the energy is amazing during that time. I can only imagine being down there. I did, genuinely did not believe that that day would ever come. Yeah. I mm-hmm. thought with the economics of baseball, we would never see the Royals yeah, in the World Series Walmart again. Yeah. yeah. And so that whole run was incredible. And then I also I got to have a few drinks with my favorite one of my favorite rappers of all time, E Forty, was at, <laughs> was at the game game, yeah, he's a game Giants six, fan. Yeah. yeah. And I actually went down and fanboyed on him a little bit, and he was really cool. And I got to take pictures with him, and yeah, I had a couple awesome. drinks with him in the Diamond Club afterwards. My buddy Gabe Serrano, shout out, he grew up on Orville, right by Bishop Ward, uh-huh. had moved out to Northern California for college. 
when we in the 90s and he was one that introduced me to E40 and the oh, whole reason I went awesome. down there was to take a picture with him just so I could send it to yeah. my buddy Gabe yeah. and uh and then we ended up hanging out actually we swapped phone numbers we were texting back oh, and forth cool. me and E40 cool. so that was fun then the world the Super Bowls I got to do the host the watch parties yeah. down in the P&L which was something else man that yeah. was that, and I got to be in a Super Bowl commercial with Patrick Mahomes. Did you really? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, we didn't. We weren't actually together filming it, but uh-huh. they used a clip from me at the watch party, and it uh, for the Red Friday watch party, and they put it in the Super Bowl. They they told me when they filmed it, it was an Adidas commercial. Mm-hmm. They're like, hey, uh, like if he wins, if he wins MVP. We're going to make this commercial. And I just, I didn't even ask for any money. I just signed whatever. I was like, I just want to be in a Super Bowl commercial. So, yeah, that was awesome, too. Yeah, it was, it was great to get to feel like you were a part yeah. of those moments in some way, in some small way. You know, at, at the San Francisco, at the Giants game, uh, I, was, I'm, I ran into Steve Perry. He sat next to us oh, when no we kidding. sat. Wow. So I geeked out a little bit as yeah. well. So I totally yeah. get that energy. That's that was big time. a good, good series there. Yeah. Anyway. So... Like you said, you've been doing this for 25 years, and you've met a ton of people. You said you met E40. Yeah. You've met, <laughs> I know that um, one of these, one of those times that you got to meet uh, the guys from Run DMC that came in, Daryl McDaniel. Daryl McDaniel. So I knew that was big. Yeah. Like, who is someone that's still in your bucket list that you want to meet that you haven't yet? Well, so this, this, I actually have met him, but I want to meet him again. And it's this is going to sound really cliche, but I, I want to. I would. I would like. Nothing more in life than to sit down in a, it, like at this place with a glass of whiskey or whatever with Jason Sudeikis because uh, yeah, let's I, make it happen. I, I got right. um, <laughs> I got to have a couple beers with him in the parking lot after a Royals game one time when he was still working at Saturday Night Live mm-hmm. and it was awesome and he seems like the he seems like one of us you know just a kind of guy that you could sit there and joke around with and and laugh with and. Um, Ended up hanging out with some of his high school buddies that night. And it was funny because they were like, hey, man, I listen to you on the radio every morning. I've always wanted to meet you. I'm like, you're hanging out with Jason Sudeikis. I care about meeting a freaking talk radio guy from Kansas City. You know, but. um, Jason, I got it. We got an empty seat. What he he did with Ted Lasso, there's never been a show that's hit me more in my heart. Mm-hmm. Than, than everything about him and that character. And I could give you, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that he would probably not want to sit and talk to me for oh, an hour about know. it. Cause like, you know, I would, I would want to re recite every different <laughs> every- scene from the show that meant something to me personally, but more so just to talk to him, man, because mm-hmm. I just think to create a show like that, what a real person, like what a real, what a real Kansas city mm-hmm. person, you know, and all of the callbacks he does to Kansas city in the show, hit me in the, and like, he's always wearing his old school J's, yep. you know, and all that stuff. I, uh, he would be the, probably the person that I would geek out the most. If, if you gave me a chance, like who could you just sit around with for an hour? It would be him. It would be Fair him. Enough. I'm thinking if there was anybody else, it would probably be outside of the world of sports. Mm-hmm. Cause like, luckily, like I got to, I got to sit down and do a one-on-one interview with Wilt Chamberlain when I was a senior oh, in college. Man. That would be amazing. Um, That's awesome. And so like, to me, if you've met Wilt Chamberlain, there's no one in the sports world that I would be in awe of, mm-hmm. but I would be in like I would be in awe of, of Jason, like you know, just just like because of what he created and everything, and because I don't travel in that circle as much. And since I got to meet E40 and Run DMC, like hip hop music was my favorite mm-hmm. genre of music. I'm trying to think, like I would love to meet Q-Tip. That would be pretty amazing from Tribe Called Quest. That's like no, my absolutely. favorite rap group yes. of all time. Um. Trying to think, that's probably those would probably be the top top of the list for me. I, I ran into the the last All Star match. Well, not the one last year we were at, but a few years back. Uh, I ended up chilling out with Waka Flocka. One oh of my, yeah, one of my, <laughs> we were at the uh, MV, you know, just a hospitality room, and that's when I Hard fell in love paint. with the MLS way they celebrate. Yeah, and uh, yeah, one of my kids goes, "You know who you're with?" They were taking pictures. <laughs> like, he no was clue. a unique fella. You know, you know, it's funny that you say that because one of the uh, one of the coolest moments for me during that whole Super Bowl run, the first the first one that the Chiefs won. They they had that big Red Friday pep rally down in the Power and Light District, yeah. and they asked me to host that. And um, Tech Nine uh-huh. and Chris Calico did a sh- did like a mini concert that night, and the place was packed. Uh-huh. And I brought my son down with me, who's a middle schooler, you know. 
And I don't know if you guys experienced this, but like for me, I, my middle school son does not think I'm very cool. You know, like, <laughs> oh, I do. I, you know, I it's, it's, it's saying. just embarrassing. It's mm -hmm. embarrassing to yeah. be around your dad. Your dad's just a nerd and lame and yeah. all that stuff. And um, I brought him down with me and we were backstage and tech came in and he goes, Bucati, what's up, man? And he gave me a hug and my son had brought a friend with him. Yeah. And my son was like, Oh my God, you know, Tech, tech Nine. Tech Nine knows nice. who you are. Yes. And I was like, Do I at least get some street cred now? Yes. And so I got to take a picture with him and Tech and they, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they, he got to show that to all his buddies at school. So that was, that was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. Great, great dude, by the way. Oh, yeah. Tech, I've met him yeah. a couple of times. Yeah. He's a good dude. Yeah. And he's very proud to be from Kansas KC. City, too, which is yeah. awesome. So, speaking of family, I see all the time that you post when you guys do your football game in the yeah. back. Yeah. Man, that, that's really cool. If you guys don't know, you have a backyard and you put the lines up and you yeah. put the, the, the touchdown with the Kansas City Chiefs in there. Yeah. Very committed. I've yeah. watched the process. Yeah. It. So when yeah. did that start? Like, and how did that start? Well, the genesis of it, honestly, was when I was a little kid. I can remember one time I came home. Like I told you with my dad, all we did, my dad would come home from work. He would take off his suit and he would say, all right, what sport are we going to play? Yeah. And we would play ball in the backyard. And one time I came home and he had mowed the backyard and he had adjusted the level of the lawnmower to make lines like a football field. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. I was out there pretending I was playing a real football game <laughs> with my dad. So when my dad moved us out to Piper, we had a pretty big backyard and I was in charge of mowing the yard. I started doing that with the lawnmower and I would mow the pattern of a baseball field into the backyard. It was a little mm -hmm. wiffle ball field and we would play wiffle ball games there all the time. Pretty nerdy stuff, you know? Well, when the pandemic hit, um, our kids were home all day um, cause they weren't going to school. Everybody yeah. was stuck in the house and I was just trying to come up with ways to make the house a little more fun. So I decided to adjust the lawnmower and mow the pattern of a soccer field in the backyard. And I took a picture of it. I posted it on Instagram and somebody commented, you know, you can buy field paint on Amazon. <laughs> and so I thought, well, shoot, I'm going to do that. You know, that will be kind of fun. Mm -hmm. So I just took some stakes and string and I didn't even measure it. I just kind of eyeballed the thing. And then when football season rolled around, I was like, I bet you I could make a football field out of this. And I started doing it and I didn't even, like I said, I didn't even measure it. I didn't really, it wasn't like the perfect angles or anything. But then I started getting really into it. And the more I would do it, the more nerdy I would get with it. My wife's a physical therapist. She has these goniometers, like a big protractor that can uh -huh. make, make right angles. So I got the angles right. I measured the field to make it perfectly to scale. It's 60 <laughs> feet long. So every five feet represents 10 yards, you know, uh -huh. with the end zones. And I, would me and I measured it now, and I've got it. And then I started watching, like, I, I drew an arrowhead at the middle. Started buying red field paint. And then I started watching the Chiefs games, and I'm like, they I actually the outlined the arrowhead with black. <laughs> yes. And the and the KC's arrow outline. I got to get some black field paint, you know. And then I started looking at the script in the end zones, and I was, and I just started getting even. And my wife's like, "You are, what's wrong with you? You're obsessed <laughs> with this definitely thing." Definitely geeking out. But Good it's, man, uh, yeah. I think it makes me happier than my own kids. Oh, I know. I see, you, know? Well, you you got your kids playing, and you and then now you have like the neighborhood kids. Coming yeah, over. that's what makes me the happiest is when the neighborhood kids come over and ask if they can play football because. You know what, honest to God, my favorite memories of living in KCK, um, my favorite neighborhood was where my grandma lived right by St. Peter's Cathedral, which mm -hmm. was, you know, she lived on uh, 14th and Riverview, like right, right down the hill from Central Avenue. A bunch of my friends lived on 16th and 7th Street there, 17th Street there, and there was a, the, the, the Gorup house was at the top of the hill, and they had a flat driveway with an adjustable basketball mm -hmm. hoop. And they would let all the kids in the neighborhood play pickup basketball yeah. there every day. And that was the spot, you know, pre-cell phone days. You, you, it was hard to coordinate with all your friends. Yeah. We would either meet at the parking the lot spot. at St. Yep. Peter's to play church ball, like baseball um, with a tennis ball. Or we would meet. You knew either you're at the parking lot at St. Peter's or you were in the Gorbs driveway playing basketball. Mm -hmm. And I always just thought, man, I want to have a house like that when I'm, if I ever become an adult, you know, I want... <laughs> to have the house where all the kids in the neighborhood are playing ball. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always, I, that, that just nothing makes me happier than hearing like, cause a lot of the kids in my neighborhood will come play basketball in my driveway. A bunch of kids that live in an apartment complex by my house and, and they don't have a place to play basketball. Yeah. I told them they can play there anytime they want. And anytime I can hear the basketball just pounding on the concrete outside, it just makes me happy. Yeah. 
you know, because like that's what kids are supposed to be doing. Yeah, playing outside. They're not supposed to be Absolutely. sitting in their room playing video Absolutely. games, which is all my kids want to do. So yeah. <laughs> I have to kick them out to go play. I'm like, oh, you got a beautiful field back there, yeah. and all the neighborhood yeah. kids want to play there, <laughs> you know but you don't. Time and effort I yeah. put this field back <laughs> yeah. there. I realized I had to just do it. I'm doing that for me, not for, you know, because it makes me happy just to walk mm-hmm. out on my deck and look, and I, I got a field in my backyard. How, how old are your kids? 14, 11, and 4. Oh, I'm tracking, yeah. yeah. Mine's 17, 15, and 13. Yeah. So I totally, yeah, you're yeah. in that spot. Yeah. So Good tell time. me about all the charity work you do. I know you're involved in a couple organizations. and. Well, the, the most personal one is a, a, a foundation I started called the Big Steps Toward Cancer Prevention Foundation mm-hmm. in honor of my buddy Sean Biggs, who died of cancer when he was 36 years old. He had a 5- and a 6-year-old at that time. That was 11 years ago now. And now his kids are in high school. One of them's getting ready to go off to college in a little over a year. Uh, so that's been crazy to, to watch them grow up. Um, what was the name of it again? I'm sorry. The, the, it's, it's called, it was technically called the Sean Biggs Memorial Foundation. Sean Biggs the events Memorial. we have, are, we always call them Big Steps Toward Cancer Prevention, mm-hmm. since his last name was Biggs. We did yeah. a 5K every year for 10 years. We're going to do a pickleball tournament this year just to change it up a little bit. Yeah. But what was kind of interesting about that one is, we did a 5K, 10K in Kansas City every year. My friend Sean was originally from Abilene, Kansas. I met him at KU. When he got out of KU, he went and got his master's degree in economic, or in uh, he got his master's degree in uh, engineering at uh, MIT in in Cambridge, Massachusetts, like the best engineering school in the yeah. world. Really smart guy. So we actually he he was really active in the running community out there. So we put on a race in Boston every year too. For 10 years, which was really cool. If you ever told me, hey, you're going to have a charity foundation in Boston, Massachusetts, yeah. you know, that wouldn't have made any sense to me at all. But I try, try to be invo- involved in as many things as possible. I'm on the board of directors for the uh, Victory Project with Sporting Kansas City. Good program. They're uh, heavily associated with uh, Children's Mercy and um, helping you know kids that are battling cancer and other challenges in mm-hmm. life and things like that. Um, I mean, I try to be available for any type of charity events that people ask me to be a part of, but those are the two that I'm most invested in. That's good. So, so you said uh, he was your one of your good friends? At, yeah, uh, he was one of my best friends from college. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was 36. Diagnosed with cancer. Nine months later, he was Jeez. he was gone. So, yeah. Although I've realized he's not gone, if that makes any sense. Yep. Like, I, he's yeah. not gone. I He continues to touch my life. 11 Spirit. years later, yeah. You know, well, it's good uh, that you still are doing something yeah. with the foundation. And Absolutely. Keeps me connected to his kids and yeah. his wife and his family, which has been very rewarding, honestly. I mean, we raised almost a million dollars over those 10 years. Jeez, that's awesome. Most of it to the KU Cancer Center, but we've mm-hmm. done some other causes as well. Um, but it's caused me to become very close with a lot of people at the KU Cancer Center, which is inspiring because you realize all the work they're doing to, um, to change outcomes. Yeah, you know, because another one of my my fraternity brothers from college also got diagnosed with stage four cancer, and he's cancer free now because of a type of treatment that's available now that didn't even exist when yeah. Sean got it. Mm-hmm. It's because of places like you know KU Cancer yeah, Center that KU keep doing amazing awesome research. Place. Yeah, I th- I think Michael should have the shop Scarlines work with you to do some kind of. Oh, hey, sure. We'd have Let's all kinds it, of good events yeah. in here. We could, yeah. you know, what this would be a great event space to something like that. Know. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, hell yeah. yeah. We're on to something. I'm working on something in January, this pickleball tournament, hopefully in January. So, mm-hmm. yeah. You going to talk KCK at all or what, man? We, yeah. You told me we're going to talk some Wyandotte well, County yeah, stuff. Yeah, we talked. I mean, we kind of skimmed through we it. We touched on it a little yeah. bit, but I, I want to. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, tell me what your favorite part is, I guess, about being from KCK or growing up in KCK. Uh, the realness. You know, yeah. just like it's such a real place. So, uh-huh. so with that, before you answer, because I can see what yeah. – what, like, what part did you hang out in down in here? Like, your honoriness, maybe? Because it sounded like you was talking, <laughs> wanting to get deep into wine. I can't I, Yeah, like, I was like super excited. Well, I have to tell you, first of all, when you reached out to me to do this, get, getting an excuse to come to Strawberry Hill mm-hmm. yes. gets me excited in a way that, that, that I can't really say any other part of the city gets me that excited. Um, like, like, coming down to the uh, to St. John the Baptist Social whatever they call it now. We used to always call it the social club, but mm-hmm. um, I, I brought some of my friends down there for the, for the Croatia watch parties. And yeah. I'm not even Croatian, man. Yeah, I mean, they my have grandpa would have been. a watch party. Yeah, the Top man. of the morning club. They have yeah. a big one event. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, was, it, Strawberry Hill's good. I was there for a lot of the World Cup watch parties last yeah. year um, because I, I was the same. You know, we went to St. Joseph's because our family was Polish, but it was the same thing. There was a, there was a social hall. There was a bowling alley. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and the, the, the shout out to the St. John's people because they've kept that, they've kept that culture and that, mm-hmm. that tradition going. But mm-hmm. you know, the thing that I like so much is that, um, oh, like where I live in Johnson County, it's very nice, very nice, a little homogenous, a little, okay. This is a good way to describe it. I remember when I moved to KCK in seventh grade, I learned how to make my grandma's potato kluskis. My mm-hmm. grandparents were both. 100% Polish. And um, the reason I learned how was because for Thanksgiving, Miss Mayfield, our teacher, had us do, and she was a Kolich originally, and so, you know, you know that. The, you know those last names in case of K. The, anything with the ski. Yeah, the if you've got a ski, you're Polish. If it ends <laughs> yeah. with an itch, you're probably Croatian, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff. And um, they had, the, our assignment was every kid had to go home and learn how to make a traditionally ethnic dish that would be served at their Thanksgiving. Uh. And we had to make it, write a paper, like an instructional paper on how you make it, like interview our grandma or whoever on how to make it and then bring it. And we all had like a big potluck dinner Uh. at the school. And I remember like, I didn't realize it at the time, but especially like where I live now, it was cool because everybody was from somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody had some kind of ethnic heritage that they knew you're Mexican American, you're, you're, you're Eastern European American, you know, you're African American, you, 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 you have a thing, you have a culture, you, and, and everybody brought something to the table in that regard. And I think there, it gives, it gives Eastern Wyandotte County a, a character mm-hmm. that Absolutely. most of the city, most of, most of the Midwest maybe lacks a little bit of, I think a lot of people are surprised. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one time my friend, Laura Zerga, who's real, her family's, she grew up in St. John's Mm -hmm. and we were like best friends all the way through high school. And they still go down to the, they're big in the ice cream social that they have there. And and, and like, I remember one time we were somewhere and, and somebody had mentioned having a Croatian background and uh, Laura said, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm Croatian. And she, they said, well, have you ever been to strawberry Hill? Like, it was like this cool place to go yeah. to. It's like, I'm from Strawberry Hill. Yeah. That's where I grew up, you know? Yeah. And so, like, just any time, I remember when my wife and I got engaged, we went to do our engagement pictures, and they're like, where would you like to go that has, like, some cool buildings or architecture that that uh, you think have really, like, some character and personality? Mm-hmm. I said, we're going to KCK. Heck yeah. You know, we're going to take pictures in front of the the old churches and places like that, and they all turned out great, you know? Because yeah. KCK just has a... It's got a personality to Absolutely. it. Absolutely, a lot when of people. Was, go ahead. When I was a park ranger, my part of my job was just to drive all over the county, and I loved the part, the fact that there were so many different pockets of what you talked about earlier about different cultures. You can get mm-hmm. the right kinds of foods, the, the conversations. I love that about Why Not County because yeah. I really learned there are real pockets of different mm-hmm. communities, and it's such well, a tight knit group yeah. too. A lot of people don't know that we are one of my, the most diverse counties in yeah. in the country oh for sure like yeah. there's 30 yeah. percent you know uh caucasian 30 percent african-american 30 percent hispanic yeah like, and we're all mixed together yeah it's and a it's, unique county yeah it's a Ooh. very yeah. unique county i love it variety is the spice of life as yeah. far as i'm concerned and you know you can to me the culture of a city and i feel fortunate enough to getting to travel to a lot of places in this country for my job these days and i love going to other cities Every time I go to another city, I end up appreciating Kansas City a little bit more. But to me, like, the two most indicative aspects of a city as to how cool I find a city, the food and the music scene. I'm glad you said fu- yeah. food. Cause yeah. Absolutely. KCK's ask, got a food scene, man. I was going to ask man. you, give oh, you me your top three or oh. what, anything you want. Give me your top three restaurants here in KCK. Oh, that's a hard. I was gonna tell you. I was gonna ask Give what's your favorite restaurant, but then I was like, eh, I can't just do that. <laughs> All right, so man, there's, there, man. Maybe you need to drink a little. Everything more. has a everything <laughs> has a personal connection to it. My favorite restaurant in KCK of all time was Mrs. Peters. Yeah, which was a fried chicken, chicken yeah. joint on State yeah. Avenue. Yeah. May I remember rest in they, peace, my man. mom bought honey butter from there, oh, and it yes. was so good. My cousin Lee and I had a birthday that was a day apart, uh-huh. and so our we we did a shared birthday every year at Mrs. Peters. Yeah, and man, those are some happy memories. And I, I still say that was the best fried chicken this city's oh, ever known by far. Um, oh, I can't, I haven't heard Mrs. Peters. In yeah, so long. yeah, real ones know, right? Yeah. Like that, yes, yes. Uh, you know. The, and and then um, 
Italian delight. Italian delight. Yeah, 100%. Shout outs to Renee. Yeah, Renee, Renee Brunetti's yeah. my yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, So when I moved back to KCK with my dad, it was just me and my dad. He was a single parent. He was working at the Brotherhood building, you know, mm-hmm. downtown. And at St. Peter's, you could, most of the kids lived in walking distance from their house. You were mm-hmm. allowed to go home for lunch yeah. as long as you were back, you know, in time. Every Friday, my dad would pick me up and take me to lunch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I didn't really stop to think about the kind of sacrifice that was. He's a busy guy trying to get work done and everything. He would take every Friday. He would come pick me up. We'd yeah. go to lunch. And the two places we would go to was Casa de Tacos, which was on Central Avenue yes. and 18th Street. Or Italian Delight in the old Indian Springs Indian shopping Springs. mall. Indian Springs yes. mall. And, yeah. and I got the same thing every single time we went. And they could see me walking in. Renee's older cousin would be slicing up a piece of pizza. For, I would get the pepperoni pizza and a dinner salad every time. Mm-hmm. And, and so now it's out in Western KCK. Whenever I am out covering a sporting event, like Sporting yeah. Kansas City event, Absolutely. I pop over to, oh, to yeah. Italian Absolutely. Delight and I see Renee. Man, I get, I get the same order as I did back yeah, in those yeah. days. So those are those are my top two. I will shout out Go Chicken Go. I don't care go what anybody go. says. Yep. There you go. Uh, sauce. Ninfas yeah. is in my top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's my, that's. I, I've been going. There's some guys I went to high school with: Jerome Tucker, Jason Denton, Kelly Taylor. Uh, we meet up at Ninfas. Mm-hmm. We try to do it once a month, but I'd say it's probably more once every two three months because everybody's mm-hmm. busy and trying to find the same date. But all those places on Kansas Avenue are. Yeah. Legit Mexican food, you know what yeah, I mean? Absolutely. So, there's this is like the the capital mecca of the world, yeah. pretty much. Good foods, yeah. yeah. Or the the taco. Forbes mecca. said it was the taco capital of the United yeah. States. Yeah. yeah. Did I miss any? What big ones did I miss? You guys tell oh, me. Maybe man. I'm. I mean. Oh, slaps. Oh, yeah. slaps, well, slaps barbecue. Is new. Slaps it's is new. new. It's new. It's new. I, 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 I don't mean slaps. to disrespect it at all because it's great. Yeah. It's just I, new, you know. I like to I like to can or Fritz's. I I grew up oh, playing around yeah. in there. That was a yeah. That's a staple. All I'm, the I'm uh, yeah. Every, when you go to Catholic school at St. Peter's back yeah, in those Fritz days, is right across the street. Half yeah. day or any like holy day of obligation, every kid in the neighborhood was at Fritz's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just terrorizing that place. <laughs> there used to be a burger joint called Eaton's. Oh yeah, yeah. go to yeah. all the time no as reason. well. Yeah, yeah. And then there's Paul's. Yeah, was, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, we can just talk yeah. all day about yeah. uh, restaurants and why not county. Mm-hmm. When backing up to Italian Delight in Indian Springs, I I grew up going to Fun Factory. Yeah, we would f- yeah. we would first go to Petland to visit my dad's friend who owned the place, and then we'd go to Fun Factory and go to Italian Delight. Oh. That yeah. was some good times down in Indian Springs. Yeah. That was a unique shopping strip. It kidding. was. Yeah, that was, it was very unique. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated high school in 91 out in Bonner, and so okay. I was like in the yeah. the late 70s and 80s growing up going into Indian Springs. And, yeah. Uh, it was happening. It was thriving back in yeah, those days. Yeah, it was thriving because I was going there in the 90s, and then I was there for the happening and then towards like when it started to die. Mm, yeah. And so my dad bought the, the movie theater in there, Oh, no kidding. Like right before it kind of closed yeah. down. I can tell you the last movie I ever saw there. What was the Rocky movie with Tommy Morrison? Was that five Rocky or six? Five. Rocky That's five. First one. Right. That Sorry. was the last movie I ever saw at Indian Springs. I remember going I there. I one of, the, got in a one fight. of my first one. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't a fighter. I was like, I'm going to. I was trying to be a peacemaker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, protect the face. <laughs> All right, so we got one more question before we okay. end this. So, tell me, I guess, what's your like five, ten year goal, man? I know you've you've accomplished a lot in your life. Yeah, I mean, my number one, I, I want to be a part of the World Cup. Uh huh. Um, it's coming in town. What yeah, two years? In, in, in two thousand twenty six. Yeah. So, um, obviously, my biggest goal would be to be doing play by play of the World Cup. Uh, now look, that's going to be competitive. There's there's only going to be so many jobs, Absolutely. and there's going to be every American sports broadcaster that does soccer is going to the biggest stage in the world is going to want to be a part yeah. of it. Yeah, um, but I'm going to do everything I can between now and then to put myself in the best position possible to have a shot at it. Yeah, and and to kind of go to the incremental goal thing to make it more. I guess incremental is just to say I want to be as big of a part of the World Cup when it's in the United States as I possibly can. Yeah. No, and obviously my my high pie pie in the sky is I want to be doing play by play. Yeah. But um I want to put myself in a position to be as big of a part of that as I can because I I do feel like I have have kind of become 
a person who is seen as the guy who carries the flag for the sport of soccer in this town, mm-hmm. you know, for a lot of people you that are, are really cra- yeah. crazy about the sport, you know, and I, I feel like I played a part, not, I'm not going to say a bit, but I was a part of the campaign mm-hmm. to get the world cup to my hometown, Yeah, you know, and I want to be as big of a part of it as I possibly can. So, um, I haven't really set any long-term goals past that. Um, I've just, everything I've got in me is focused on being as big of a part of the world cup because I think that, that there it's, I don't think, I know that's going to be the biggest sporting event to have ever been in Kansas city oh, ever by yes. far, by far, you know, it's and huge. our town is going to realize yeah. how big this is. Mm-hmm. And the fact that our city is that's a part true. of it. Mm-hmm. We're the only city that's not a top 14 yeah. media market yeah. in, that got picked. And we should be incredibly proud of that, mm-hmm, by the yeah. way. Incredibly proud because it's all down to how good of a bid we put together compared yeah. to everybody else because we did it the way Kansas City does things. Everybody showed so much damn pride, yeah. you know, in trying to get it here. So that's the biggest thing. Well, I'm involved in the soccer from like Special yeah. Olympics and Unified and MLS, and I see all the the work they're doing for that uh, the World Cup. So. That would be a huge step to be in behind that mic on something like that. Yeah. That would be an amazing moment because I know how big this, we all know how big that's going to be. Well, I don't have any influence, but if I, if I did, or if I (laughs) do, I'll I'll push you. I appreciate it. Posting online or something. You know who needs to be rock ass up for World Cup? Hey, they're going to make their decisions, you know, based on what, who they think the best is. So Mm -hmm. I just got to keep grinding and, and be as good as I can possibly be and get, keep getting better. And ch- prove to whoever's watching that that they they should want me as part of it. It's up to me, you know what yeah. I mean. So yeah, well, it's been a pleasure. Do you want to give any shout outs to anything or anybody, any social media platforms or? Um, obviously, shout out Sports Radio Eight Ten WHB. Yeah. If you haven't watched um, it or yeah. listened to it, it's yeah, in the mornings, what um, six to ten, six a.m. to ten a.m. Yeah. Monday through Friday. Shout out to Stephen St. John, my co-host, yeah. who has some KCK Great roots. Yeah. His uncle was a KCK police yep. officer. Mm-hmm. Um, his mom was uh, was an Antiveros from uh, from KCK. Um, so shout out to Jake uh, Jake Gutierrez, who does who produces the show uh he's got some yeah, he's case back. yeah he's back yeah. which is great so any, everybody at a10 that's been amazing to me uh my whole career mls season pass sign up for it you know watch all the games that you can support yeah. support the sport in this country i would really appreciate that i'm trying to think any i'm trying to think if there's anybody kck wise that i need yeah. to, that i need to give some love to yeah there's, strawberry hill podcast so you yeah get man uh you just, can always you always keep the Irish in on there. You got Pete McCleskey. You gotta, well, you gotta throw hey, the Irish clan out. There. Hey man, I grew up with a bunch of Burns. Oh, I'll, oh, I'll, oh I'll <laughs> with you. The Burns clan's a good one. That's hey, a big clan, you know. Um, but I, I think that um, I, I guess I would finish by saying this: I, I I'm incredibly grateful and proud to say that I'm from Wyandotte County, and and I remember somebody told me one time that there's two types of people from KCK. Mm -hmm. The type of person that'll give you the shirt off his back and the type of person that'll take it from you. (laughs) You And it's kind of like you, and sometimes maybe you're the same person, but I think more than anything, it's one or the other. And, and the, and the, 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 the people I know from Wyandotte County who would give you the shirt off their back are the greatest people I've ever known, mm-hmm. Absolutely. you know, and, and I, I use his name a lot. His wife, Cassie gets really mad at me cause she thinks he gets too much love, but Jerome Tucker yeah. is one of those guys for me. He's like the, he em- embodies, you need something, no questions asked. Mm-hmm. I drop what I'm doing and yeah. I'm going to be there for mm-hmm. you. Yes. And I like that analogy because a shirt off your back is different than giving you a shirt that I've got a million shirts in my dresser yeah. drawer and I'm going to give you one of those. Absolutely. I'll give you something that I need because you need it. Yep. And um, I've never been anywhere in my life felt the sense of support um, from other people like the support I feel from the people I grew up with in Wyandotte County. Yep. Absolutely. And um, I, I just want to say, like, I hope that KCK never loses that ethos mm-hmm. because more than anything, that's what makes it. We were talking about the stuff that makes it special. I should have started with that. That's what makes KCK special more than anything else is the people and the, the spirit of, of supporting one yeah, another. We're yeah. proud to be from the dot. Yeah. Well, I felt that when we ran into each other in D.C. Yeah. with you and Tony sitting yeah. there. I, once I left there, when I left to our, we played that. 
yeah. an hour afterwards, yeah. my team. And I felt that Wyandotte County vibe that you were talking about just now. That's so cool, I, man. It's, it's, it's solid. It's soulful when you come from here. Yeah. Even if I'm a Bonner Springs kid, some of them just kind of let yeah. me back in, you know, they're you're on no. Strawberry Hill right now. I yeah. am. Yeah. That's a shop. <laughs> this That's place right. is awesome, by the way. Well, this you. is great. Thank man. You. You know, People well, should come cool. down here and yeah. see this yeah. place. If Shops they have Cigar it. Lounge, if you haven't been, come yeah. check us out. We put 407 of, North 6th Street. We put a lot of chaotic thoughts in to make this happen. Yeah. Great, and Michael man. just kind of, well, here it is. Nate, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate hey, you man, coming thanks on. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah. You're going to have to come back and talk some more. Yeah, talk some more sports, talk some more Wyco and all the above. Uh, thank Shout you out Wyandotte County Swim Club too. Swim I got to do that. Yeah. Swim a lot of time there yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. Swim yeah. club. <laughs> what was their mascot? Uh, the, was it the dolphins or like the sharks? No, no, it was just a swimming pool. It was a swimming pool, swim swim pool, pool like a wreck. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the yeah. most popular guy there was C- Cannonball John. He, he he would get up and do <laughs> cannonballs off the high dive, and everybody loved him. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Like I said, like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell. We get a chance. Tune in next week. And then I don't know who we got this next week, but we'll, we'll let you guys know. And uh, we'll see you next time. I'll see you. Goodbye, everybody.